Good. Um, well, thanks again, Paul, and hello to everybody um, that's out there. Good morning, I guess, to you. you know, I, I certainly wish, as probably most of the seminar speakers have wished, that I could be there in person and catching up with a lot of you since it's been a couple of years now since I've had a chance to, to talk to many of you. Um, but it, it's fun for me to be here today um, to talk a little bit more about some of the work that I'm getting involved in here in Duluth, Minnesota. Um, located on the shores of Lake Superior. So uh, today I'm going to talk a little bit about um, a, a look at marine energy and some of the observation challenges we have here in the, the Great Lakes environment. So to give everyone their bearings, um, if you're not familiar with the Midwest and Minnesota specifically, um, the University of Minnesota has five campuses scattered around the state um, I'm located at the Duluth campus, which is about three hours north of Minneapolis St. Paul. Um, we're the second largest campus of the University of Minnesota system. Uh, we have about 10,000 students compared to the 50,000 that are at the main Twin Cities campus. And we're primarily an undergraduate and, and master's degree awarding university. Um, give you a little a look of our environment you know, during the nice warm summer months, um, our campus is nice and compact. Uh, we're perched up on top of the hill overlooking Lake Superior. Um, again, we're at the, the far western arm of Lake Superior, pretty much the headwaters of the whole Great Lake system. Uh, the St. Louis River here feeds into the, the western arm of Lake Superior and uh, we start to flow uh, eastward towards the Atlantic Ocean from this point. Um, we're also known for being uh, big into our hockey here. Uh, UMD is consistently uh, the national champions for uh, the college hockey league. Uh, so that's a, a big part of pride for us here in Duluth. And then we also operate and own um, the only UNALS vessel that operates on the Great Lakes. The, the RV Blue Heron is part of the Large Lakes Observatory, which is based here at the University of Minnesota Duluth. It's a 90 foot research vessel um, that uh, will go out on projects all summer long uh, throughout most of the Great Lakes. Yeah, Duluth was really um, built up. Um, it, it's the, the largest inland port. It's the largest port on the Great Lakes. And um, in terms of total tonnage, um, it, it consistently ranks in the top uh, 30 or 40 ports in the United States. Um, the, the shipping industry and the port here in Duluth was largely built around the mining industry. So Northern Minnesota is known as the Iron Range. Um, it's a substantial contributor to the iron and steel mining or the iron mining um, that goes into steel products around the US. And so the shipping industry was largely built around that. But more recently, we've um, transitioned to actually being one of the center hubs for delivering wind turbine components. So uh, here's our I iconic lift bridge in downtown Duluth. And all summer long, we're getting uh, ships entering the harbor, delivering uh, wind turbine components, towers and blades that are then uh, trucked off to various wind farms around Iowa and the Dakotas and, and throughout Minnesota. So uh, this shipping industry has become such a large um, focal point of Duluth here. Um, but for those of you that you know, are, are music fans out there, um, perhaps you've come across Gordon Lightfoot and, and his famous song, The Wreck of the Edmund Fitzgerald. So uh, the Edmund Fitzgerald was this ship that's, that met its demise here on Lake Superior um, several decades ago. Um, it, was, it was responsible for carrying some of that iron ore around the Great Lakes. And so, you know, we have, we have this thriving shipping industry here in Duluth. Uh, but as we get towards the fringe seasons of, of the year, you know, yeah, November and December and into the winter months, uh, we get at least what are called locally the gales of November coming across the Great Lakes. And so this is ultimately uh, these large storms that we get on Lake Superior and throughout the Great Lakes is, is eventually what led to the demise of the Edmund Fitzgerald. And so, you know, it's, it's not hard to see that when we get into these fringe seasons, um, 
we're often encountering you know, very impressive storms and very impressive waves that are, at least in my mind, somewhat reminiscent of, of the large storms um, um, that you get on the oceans. Certainly nothing quite as extreme as the Pacific Northwest, but um, it, it's easy to see that we have a substantial amount of energy uh, in these waves here in Lake Superior during these, these extreme storms. This, this lighthouse picture is the lighthouse that is um, down on the water near that iconic lift bridge here in Duluth. You know, several people in the area actually uh, look forward to this period of the year. We, we have a big surfing community here on the Great Lakes. Um, and you know, there, it's a, it takes a special kind of person to wanna go out and surf right when the water is near freezing. And you can see we get some impressive um, beard icicles forming in the winter months. Those storms though, unfortunately also, they, they cause a lot of damage and um, year after year, the, these gales of November, these large storms that come rolling down the western arm of Lake Superior, uh, cause a lot of economic damage um, to our coastlines. There's a lot of coastal susceptibility, coastal erosion, and, and even here in Duluth, uh, time and time again, we get, we get uh, storm surge set up and these large waves that end up flooding uh, a lot of our, our business areas that are down located near the water. So, you know, year after year, over the past several decades, we've, uh, the city has had to deal with um, these, these large storms impacting and, and flooding out our infrastructure um, and repeatedly has been uh, committing millions of dollars to repair the damages that, that are caused by these storms. And so I joined uh, the University of Minnesota Duluth in the mechanical engineering department um, last fall, fall of 2019. And as I joined the department, I had this vision that I wanted to bring together you know, several interests of mine um, that, that have stemmed out of my background uh, from graduate school and my, my time out at the University of Washington, um, combining you know, the, the research and development I've, I've worked in in marine energy um, looking more into marine observation capabilities and technologies here for the Great Lakes. Uh, UMD has a, a relatively small, it's an 80 foot tower vertical axis wind turbine here uh, near campus. Um, so getting students engaged in, in uh, wind energy technologies and in research and development and combining those all together to you know, look at how we um, can engineer these systems in cold climates and specifically for the marine and atmospheric environments um, and, and making observations in these um, often challenging conditions. So, you know, I, I look back to some of the uh, involvement I got to be a part of when I, during my postdoc out at uh, UW with, with many of you. And you know, one of the things that comes to mind is uh, going out to swim and um, helping with the re recovery of uh, the AMP um, and, and just looking at you know the vast amount of uh, critters and, and sea life that attached itself to that um, that device over a relatively short amount of time. And so one thing I quickly learned uh, coming back here to Lake Superior and Duluth is that was much nicer working in freshwater. Um, we can we can send sensors out for a year or more at a time, uh, and they come back squeaky clean. So. Uh, certainly one of the advantages of, of working in freshwater is that we, we don't have to spend hours and hours cleaning off the marine life that attach itself to our sensors here in Lake Superior. And so um, one of the things that I've, I've started working on here in the mechanical engineering department is, is starting to um, bring together all of these observations that have been occurring in the marine environment on Lake Superior. And so um, just as all around the world, the, the NDBC um, operates um, many observation buoys. There's, there's quite a few located here on Lake Superior. Um, many of them are owned and operated by universities themselves. So the University of Minnesota Duluth, we, we operate uh, two observational buoys 
in the far western arm of Lake Superior. Um, Michigan Tech University, uh, the Great Lakes Research Center, op operates three buoys near the Keweenaw Peninsula. Northern Michigan University um, operates three buoys along the, the south shore on the eastern portion of the lake. And then NOAA has three of their buoys, uh, mid-lake buoys that they've been deploying since around 1980 here in Lake Superior. And then our neighbors to the north, Environment Canada, uh, deploy and operate a buoy along the northern reaches of Lake Superior. And so it's been interesting as we start to look at you know, these data that exist from these buoys, um, the, the three NOAA buoys circled in blue in the center, the mid-lake buoys, they've been operating since about 1980, so roughly 40 years of data. Uh, the other buoys really didn't come online until um, 2010 at the earliest. So uh, in the past 10 years, we've really started to expand our observational capabilities here in the Great Lakes. Uh, what's interesting though is, you know, we can take the data from the past 40 years from all of those buoys. It's, it's certainly provided us a wealth of very valuable information for the Great Lakes environment. Here I'm just showing the air temperatures from all of those buoys. Um, but when we dive in a little deeper, um, and we look at the distribution of all of those measurements occurring, you can see that you know it's it's certainly clustered around the summertime. It makes sense. We're you know, we're in a freshwater system, cold cold climate. It's challenging to operate these systems in the winter. And so, you know, over the past forty years, ninety nine percent of our on water observations have occurred during this this eight month period, um, spanning from April until uh, the middle to end of November. And so we have this this huge data gap. Um, a third of the year, we have very little data about our marine environment. Um, the, the university, you know, UMD here and the Large Lakes Observatory and, and several of the other uh, research centers scattered around the Great Lakes, we often deploy subsurface uh, moorings with thermistors and ADCPs scattered around the lakes to take uh, underwater measurements. Um, below the ice as it forms in the winter, but in terms of measurements of surface characterization and, and surface observations, there's almost no data during this four month period outside of the summer then. So like I mentioned, you know, there's, there's obvious challenges in collecting these observations uh, in this sort of environment where we, we're often getting a lot of uh, surface ice um, this, this image here, the satellite images from one of the maximum extents of, of surface ice coverage we've, we've experienced here on Lake Superior. And so you know, it varies greatly from year to year. Some years we get almost no ice coverage. Uh, I think the maximum we've gotten to is around 96% uh, coverage. So uh, it it's drastic, uh, varies drastically year to year. Um, so adding additional challenges, but in my opinion, also additional opportunities to look into ways that we can um, advance our observing capabilities and, and un better understand our marine environment um, during this winter period, which is especially when a lot of those extreme storms are, are coming down the coastline. So, you know, looking back, uh, these, these big storms that roll down the western arm, um, oftentimes during the winter, uh, late fall and winter, the, the winds shift direction, they blow out of the northeast, so we have uh, almost a 300 mile fetch across Lake Superior that, that allows these waves to build up and blow down towards um, our harbor here in Duluth. And so shortly after I started um, last fall, um, actually almost a year ago exactly, uh, we had one of those big storms roll through over Thanksgiving weekend. Uh, it dumped two feet of snow on Duluth. So luckily this year we, we don't have quite this much snow yet, but um, I spent several days digging out of my backyard after the storm rolled through the western arm of Lake Superior. Um, 
but luckily before the storm rolled through, I was able to go out and deploy a subsurface ADCP uh, roughly 20 kilometers offshore. So if you can see my mouse, you know, this little entrance here is where the, the iconic lift bridge is in Duluth. And we took the RV Blue Heron out, uh, recovered the surface buoys that the university operates, um, and at the same time deployed a subsurface winter mooring with, with a five beam um, signature 500 ADCP um, set up to measure currents and, and specifically the surface waves uh, during these big storms that we often get. And so, you know, one thing to notice, this is, these are the data from that big Thanksgiving weekend storm and zooming in in the middle of the night on December 1st. Um, it, it was nice that we were able to capture some of these large waves that were coming down the Western arm. So the ADCP measured, you know, anywhere from five to six meter waves uh, coming down during that storm. What was interesting though is, you know, I, I took that period and the Great Lakes Environmental Research Lab, um, they're, they're funded by NOAA and they operate the Great Lakes Coastal Forecasting System. So you know, they provide uh, outwards of four to five days of forecast for, for surface winds, um, currents within the lake and, and surface waves, uh, largely used by the shipping industry and, and coastal communities in the area. And so I went back and looked at what their forecasts were for that same exact period when we got this, this big storm a year ago and specifically you know, extracted the data from where I had de deployed the subsurface ADCP. Um, and when, when I looked at the data from that forecast for that same exact period of time, the forecasts were really only calling for at most four meter waves. And so um, our, our ADCP was capturing, uh, frequently capturing five to six meter waves, uh, which you can you know, readily see that that difference in wave height can have a big impact on the damage it causes uh, to coastal communities or any mariners that might be out on the Great Lakes during this period of time. And so, you know, the Plural, the Great Lakes Research Environmental Research Lab is currently working on updating their numerical models to be to have a finer unstructured grid. Um, up until now, the entire region of Lake Superior was covered by a, a 61 by 30 cell um, grid. So you know, each one of those cells was roughly 10 kilometers by 10 kilometers. So you can see a very coarse resolution um, forecasting system for the Great Lakes. And so that, that is certainly one of the sources of error between the actual measurements occurring and what the forecasts were calling for uh, during that time. And so, you know, using the, these measurements that I collected during my first winter here at UMD, um, I, I really formed this idea of, you know, how can I engage undergrad and master's students here in R&D, um, looking at marine and atmospheric observations, but also bring in my background in, in marine energy and look at uh, you know, the trend in these blue economy opportunities that um, is becoming so uh, such a focal point of marine energy at this point. Um, so I'll, I'll start by looking at how you know, the combination of engaging undergrad and master's students with marine observations. Before I continue forward, I, you know, I certainly have to acknowledge um, we have an outstanding senior design class that spans the mechanical, electrical, and industrial engineering uh, departments here at UMD. And so I've had the pleasure of you know, working with uh, quite a few very talented students. Um, and it's been fun getting them engaged in developing these, these observation systems um, specifically for the Great Lakes, since many of them have, have grown up in this area. You know, one of the things we've, we've looked at is that there's a whole handful of uh, different types of observation systems available, both on the market, but also being developed uh, by uh, universities. You yourself out at University of Washington has have several different iterations of these types of um, systems being developed. And so, as you know, you know they, they span a, a very wide range in terms of cost, anywhere from the 
the DIY components down to a couple hundred dollars, upwards of 25 to 50K for a more advanced observation system. And depending on where you land in this scheme of, of observation systems, the required infrastructure that comes along with, with deploying these varies greatly. So, you know, our, our larger, more um, observation buoys require the Blue Heron to go out on Lake Superior, a relatively large crew and a crane. Whereas when you get down to these handheld, um, smaller devices, we can certainly go out in much smaller uh, vessels and even fishing boats uh, to, to deploy them. So there's a large range of um, systems. And I've been working with these students to think about ways that we can design you know, a low cost open source system uh, you know, not unlike those being developed out at UW, um, that can really um, help us fill in this data gap that occurs when these larger, more expensive um, surface buoys are recovered, typically late October or early November. So you know, over the past um, nine or 10 months, we've been working together to to develop this um, Great Lakes Lagrangian data buoy. So it's a, a drifting buoy um, equipped currently with air and water temperatures, uh, GPS for real-time tracking. Um, and then it, because we can get out, you know, we have the potential to get out in very remote regions uh, of Lake Superior, uh, it's currently equipped with satellite communications. Uh, inside the hull of the buoy, there's an IMU for, for real-time wave measurements and onboard data processing. And so the, the whole goal behind this was to develop this open source uh, data platform, um, allowing users in the research community to define their desired sampling protocols, uh, enable real-time tracking and, and um, real-time communications, and be able to uh, better document the, the waves during these large storms that we're getting here on Lake Superior. Um, in its current state, we're, we're hopefully working this winter, if, if COVID precautions allow, to actually build our first one to deploy um, and test next summer. And as we think about the future of this system, um, we're looking at other sensors to add into it as well. You know, the, here on the Great Lakes, uh, harmful algal blooms are starting to become a uh, frequent occurrence and certainly a focal point moving forward. And so we're looking at ways to add sensors to monitor water quality, but also with the advent of um, smaller and, and lower power consumption ADCPs, um, how can we add those into the system as well? And ultimately, this all feeds into this mission for the, the Smart Great Lakes Initiative, where this uh, between Blural and NOAA and the Great Lakes Observing System, there's this vision to incorporate new technologies, uh, new observation systems into the Great Lakes environment. And, and how can this system feed into that, um, feed into the goals of this Smart Great Lakes initiative? Um, you know, as an added point to that, um, there's a lot of uh, interest in looking at other forms of communication. And so we've been exploring uh, LoRa, which is a um, low power, long range, wide area network form of communication using radio frequencies. And so there are opportunities here to um, use local gateways to actually have these smaller low cost um, systems uh, scattered more, you know, more densely along the shore here near Duluth uh, without having to pay for a cell plan or, or a, a satellite communications where it's not even needed in this point at this location. Um, so, you know, thinking ahead, you know, we're, we're certainly moving towards validating this system, um, looking at adaptations for uh, being able to deploy these on the ice in the winter to look at ice tracking, uh, making it more transportable and making it available to community scale monitoring here. Um, Minnesota is known for its land of 10,000 lakes. And so we have a lot of uh, communities that, you know, you can buy a weather station for your backyard and perhaps they would like something for their marine environment as well. And moving forward, looking at materials and then you know, some of the specific science questions um, largely focused around these large waves we're getting uh, during the gales of November and in through the winter months. 
So as I mentioned, you know, an, another focal point was to engage students in um, R&D, largely focused around marine energy and these, these blue economy opportunities that have become such a focal point. So I know this year, um, I believe PMEC has two teams represented in the uh, marine energy collegiate competition. Um, I, I wish you the best of luck as you move forward with that, if you're involved with that. Uh, last year, UMD, we, we had a team as part of the inaugural uh, marine energy competition. So it was, it was exciting for me to be able to engage a group of bright undergraduate students and, and expose them to marine energy, which is you know, largely a new um, area here in Duluth. As part of that, we started to look at, you know, what actually is the wave resource here on the Great Lakes. So using those NOAA buoys, we were able to go in and look at uh, the characteristics of the, of the waves that we get, keeping in mind that really we only have measurements from an eight month period of time. And also keeping in mind that, you know, this is nothing like what the coastal US experiences in terms of wave resource. So uh, we, I was able to introduce the students to methods of uh, you know, how do we characterize the available energy in waves and how does that compare to the much more uh, resource rich environments around the US. And so when you, you know, certainly superimpose these onto say for example off the coast of Oregon you can see the differences instantly. We have a much more narrow band um, wave resource you know almost an order of magnitude less in terms of annual energy production capabilities. Um, so, you know, it, it's nothing like the extreme waves off of the coast of Oregon or Washington, uh, but we started to find, you know, when you start to think about uh, these, these opportunities in the blue economy that perhaps uh, the Great Lakes can start to play a role in, in furthering the development of uh, different technologies. Um, we, we've started moving forward with uh, looking more at characterizing the entire Great Lakes environment. Uh, first, starting with the, the available model data, uh, looking at both annual and seasonal wave characteristics, comparing that with the buoy observations that are available, and you know, really starting to find that we do need improvements in these models to better um, model the dynamics in our system. And the, and how can we improve both observations and modeling uh, to, to uh, be able to, to better characterize um, the, the significant wave height and ultimately uh, the available wave resource in this environment. Uh, and as you see in these, in these satellite images, you know, how do we extend these observations to improve our models during the winter months when we have ice forming on the surface and very mobile ice as well, drifting around and interacting with these, these waves and these storms. So, uh, you know, looking back to the available measurements on Lake Superior, we were certainly starting to look into the seasonal variability, which is you know, similar to that on the West Coast. We get these larger storms coming in in the winter months. Um, looking at methods for filling this data gap, this four month chunk of, um, the year where we have almost no data for the surface environment on our Great Lakes. And then looking forward into what different uh, marine energy opportunities can we investigate um, to, to help build this uh, blue economy um, focus. I highlight the largest wave ever recorded here on Lake Superior. Uh, three years ago, we had almost a 30 foot wave that was measured during one of those storms. So when you start to think about these blue uh, economy opportunities, you know, there are a couple that certainly come to mind. Uh, one of them being power for observation systems, which I know um, many of you are, are focused on looking at and realizing that, you know, the, the Great Lakes, I, I do believe we have a potential to, you know, contribute to the research and development in this area, um, you know, looking at longer deployments, adding more sensors, more power hungry sensors and, and increasing um, the onboard uh, processing that's available. But we also bring to the table, you know, lots of uh, challenges for this industry. You know, if, we, if we start to look at the Great Lakes, 
how can these energy systems survive icing conditions and what impacts do they have on a freshwater environment? And then thinking more globally, you know, as, as sea ice starts to diminish in the Arctic regions, um, you know, if we start to think about uh, blue economy opportunities for the polar regions, you know, any sort of marine energy technology might have to encounter uh, interactions with surface ice. And, and understanding how these technologies um, might behave differently, what sort of loading they might in, uh, incur. Um, you know, the Great Lakes environment has uh, potential to contribute in this area in that we, we often get surface ice floating around in the winters and it's certainly a much more affordable and accessible location than, than uh, testing devices immediately in the polar regions. And so uh, the, this intersection of uh, cold climates and, and moving the opportunities from the marine energy sector um, to um, the polar regions. I think there, there's a lot of opportunity here um, if we can improve our understanding of the Great Lakes environment. So oh, I, I hope I at least gave you a, a good snippet into um, some of the activities here in Duluth. Um, specifically focusing around merging these interests of mine in marine energy and um, observational technologies um, and, and getting uh, the students here at UMD um, integrated into, a, uh, into these, these two industries, which is a relatively a, a new area for many of them here in the Great Lakes region. So with that, I, I thank you for all for the time today and um, yeah, I'll be happy to answer any questions you might have. Great, thanks, Greg. Uh, really cool to see what's going on there as a uh, former Great Lakes resident. Um, does anyone have any questions? Oh, we have one in the chat. Let's see. I can view the chat. Oh, Elsa, it's nice talk, Greg. Thank you. I had a question, Craig. Yeah. To see you. Uh, thanks for the talk. Yeah. Um, I, I, I think I lost track of um, what year it was deployed. Were you saying that um, you deployed an ADCP last year before that storm and that that is something that's meant to stay there over the winter during that gap? Or that's something you're hoping the new device that you're working on will be able to like withstand the winter conditions? Um, I, I guess the, the thought is that if we can you know, keeping systems out all winter long at this point on the surface is uh, is going to be very challenging. And so using these um, lower cost, lighter weight systems to, to measure waves, it gives us the opportunity to um, you know, have many of them and quickly go out and deploy them ahead of these storms and be able to, uh, in, in in more real time, be able to observe the conditions during these storms that we frequently get. Um, when we go out and deploy these subsurface moorings, like what you what I talked about um, over last winter, you know, we have to go out in October, deploy the sensors, and we typically don't get them back until May or June of the following year. And so, um, it's it's not real time data. Um, and so the, the idea is to you know, look at ways that we can fill in this data gap with, with lower cost systems that are more readily deployed with, with less infrastructure, just because of the logistics of, you know, we can't get out of the harbor often in the winter months with the, the ice that's forming or, or these big storms that are coming down the Lake Superior. Are there, are there other ways then to, um like before and after a storm, get out and um, deploy something like temporary? Um, there, there would be. It's, it, 
I guess in, in terms of the, the moorings that we typically deploy, uh, we have, you know, we have the, the RV Blue Heron, which, um, you know, for us, it's expensive to take out. It costs roughly $5,000 a day just to, to take it out. You know, in terms of the ships that UW operates, that's, that's nothing, but uh, it, yeah, I guess the, the planning and the logistics and the cost to go out to deploy, quickly deploy moorings um, on the Great Lakes is typically prohibitive. Um, and so looking at, you know, ways that don't require that, that larger infrastructure to deploy and recover these moorings. Right. Yeah, thank you. Yep. Hey, Craig, I have a question. Uh, knowing sure. nothing about Minnesota weather, um, how uh, like variable is the like predominant wind direction on the lake? And how does that kind of change uh, like where you'd want to put a wave energy converter? I feel like my, my knowledge of like lake winds here is that, you know, most of the big storms in the winter come out of the south. So you'd want to put it like toward the northern end of a lake. But sure. you seem like on a very kind of eastern or western tip. Uh, is that the predominant kind of like high wave location? Yeah, are, let's see. Are you all still seeing my um, screen? Yeah. So uh, the wind directions here are actually relatively seasonally consistent. You know, during the, it varies a lot, but during the late fall through early spring period, uh, the winds typically blow out of the Northeast. And so they're coming down. If you picture Lake Superior as a inverted V, um, they're coming down this Western arm of Lake Superior during the winter months. Um, so we get, often get most of the large storms in that in this western arm of the lake during the winter and late fall. And then um, during the summer, it shifts direction and the winds come out of the northwest. And so the, the southeastern portion of the lake and the, the eastern shore of the lake often gets these large storms. So it, it kind of fluctuates back and forth depending on the, the type of year or the time of year. So in, in your, uh, with your capstone group or, or the marine energy competition group, then were you guys kind of optimizing where on the lake you might kind of want to put, put a device to kind of avoid the worst of the big storms and, and capture some of that summer resource more? Um, are you thinking of the, the marine energy competition? Yeah, yeah. Oh, they, uh, you know, for that competition, they actually, their, their business idea uh, it was focused around underwater data centers and it actually their target deployment location was not on the great lakes they they decided that you know it was it was fun to learn about the resource on the great lakes but um to power something like a data center they needed a larger wave resource so they looked elsewhere I'll be excited to you know keep up with the teams from UW and OSU this year to see where the team ends up going with, with that competition. I can speak on that a little bit. Okay. And ask a question. Um, yeah, I saw a couple of people from our team um, on this call. I'm from OSU on the MACC team, and we're actually looking at um, filling a, a market gap in. Um, in ocean observation. And so, yeah, we were pretty excited to see this talk today. Um, so you're talking about buoy data. Nice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we might be reaching out with more questions in the interview. Yeah, yeah, I'd, I'd, happy, I'd be happy to serve as a resource as needed for, for your team. Yeah, awesome. Thank you for the presentation. Craig, I had a question sure. about I, I love I love your uh, data buoys. Um, I am curious uh, a, a couple things. Um, one, I saw in the the plot of 
um, types of devices versus cost and quality. Uh, you did have the the data the um, the so far data well buoys there, yeah. and I'm curious why you didn't kind of just go for an option like that that's off the shelf that's relatively inexpensive. Um, mm -hmm. Was it a? I'm guessing the answer is going to be like teaching opportunities uh, in building things plus like having the like an in-house thing that you get to play around with guts of more and control what's on board. But I'd love yeah. to hear you talk on that. Yeah, I mean, that was, that was certainly um, one of the big drivers behind it was you know, engaging students and learning more about what goes into these observation systems um, specifically for wave measurements and, and the marine environment. Um, also, you know, I'll, I'll be honest, I, I don't know a ton about the SOFAR spotter buoy other than the cost of it and, and the general data it provides, but also wanting to provide um, an open source platform that could be uh, customized by many different research groups. You know, we have a lot of groups that are specifically focused on harmful algal blooms here and, and integrating different sensors that could be beneficial to, to those, uh, the goals of those projects. So, you know, in, in its current form, it's all, it's, it's Raspberry Pi based, you know, everything is open source and off the shelf easily. Well, I guess the flotation buoy is not off the shelf, but uh, <laughs> Besides that, everything is you know, off the shelf components that can be integrated into um, a low cost system. And, and you know, right now, if you don't account for the, the new small ADCP that we're looking at or some of those water quality sensors were right around um, 1,000 to $1,200 for the system. Granted, there's a lot of uh, manual undergraduate labor and um, software development that has gone into that <laughs> so yeah nice that's awesome um yeah. uh, what are you using for your satellite system um it's it's a rock seven okay iridium module i i'd seen them early on but i haven't actually looked back at them so okay. maybe i should check again how big is the whole system um the di the diameter of the buoy right now is 18 inches so you know picture of the diameter of a basketball hoop. It's essentially that, um, you know, a large, we, we have enough battery in there to go nine days unsupport or without any recharging. Um, the, the solar panels certainly add time to that. Um, and so if you, you know, condense everything into just the sensors and, and the brains behind it all, it, it would essentially fit in the palm of your hand. Um, Awesome. So a lot of it is to get that buoyancy for all of the batteries that are in there. Yeah. Fair enough. Yeah. Sweet. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, are there any more questions for Craig? Okay. Um, well, I'm sure he'll be able to, uh, willing to answer more questions if you have them. Uh, send him my email. Um, great. Well, thanks everyone. Thanks, Craig. Uh, this was fantastic. And uh, if you're interested, we're gonna have our final seminar of the quarter next week with um, Hamish McDonald from Catapult uh, in the UK to do offshore wind development and environmental monitoring. Uh, so uh, feel free to attend. And, Great. Uh, yeah, thanks, Paul. And thanks, everybody, for taking the time to listen in. It was, it was fun to at least catch up a little bit with everybody. So.